Marriage is primarily about trust and respect for personal boundaries. If I do not accept something, then my partner should not encourage me to do it, and vice versa. My wife was into something that ruined our marriage. As it turned out, it was destroyed a long time ago. Very well. There may be additional charges later, but for now. Abigail Ruth Davies, I am arresting you for the attempted murder of Samantha Lloyd Smith. You have the right to remain silent. That was when my wife fainted. Had I been quick enough, I might have caught her before she hit the floor. But then again, I figured it was a much softer blow than the one she had planned for Sammy. So I made a half-hearted effort, knowing it wouldn't really work. Let me introduce you to the key players in this little drama before I proceed, starting with myself. I'm Robert Davies, Robbie to my friends, and I'm what you'd call an unlikely accountant. By that, I mean I grew up on a rough council estate where most of my peers, those who didn't end up in jail at least, either took on manual labor jobs or joined the ranks of the long-term unemployed. I got lucky. I started working at a carpet factory, and after consistently messing up whatever loom I was assigned to, I was moved to the storeroom. Over time, my knack for organization and numbers caught the attention of the owner, Griffin Lloyd, who moved me into the dispatch office. For no particular reason, I decided to take a bookkeeping course at the local college of further education. Surprisingly, I really enjoyed it. Yes, really. After earning an outstanding grade, Mr. Lloyd transferred me to the main office and supported me through my certification as an accountant. That's when I first met his stunning daughter, Samantha. Odd as it seems now, it was hate at first sight. She was nothing like her father. While he was a hard-working, down-to-earth man who had earned his success, she was a spoiled only child, indulged by her father and pushed up the social ladder by her ambitious mother. I'm sure you've met someone like that. Most people have. But I was the unlucky one chosen to mentor her from inherited wealth to partially earned wealth. What probably made things worse was that she was stunningly beautiful. Long, blonde hair, an impossibly cute face, and a figure that was curvy and mature even at 19, along with legs that haunted the fantasies of most of the male staff. And she was fully aware of it. To put it bluntly, she was a teasing flirt. A couple of years later, she married Gerald. Please don't call me Jerry. It's too common. Smith, a man who seemed to be her perfect match. She was flirtatious. He thought he was irresistible. She was spoiled. He was an arrogant jerk. She had money, and he had a lifestyle that demanded it. But now it's time to introduce the final character in this small cast. Enter Abigail Ruth Marley, as she was when I first met her. She worked in the factory as one of the creelers, those who sorted wool or nylon hanks and operated the machines that wound them onto plastic cones, which were then used to feed threads into the looms. Like me, she came from a council estate, but unlike me, she hadn't pursued any further education. No, Abby believed her looks would be enough to lift her out of hardship. All she needed was a man who would be fascinated by her beauty, who would help her stop fighting and start living an easy life. And I'm sure you can guess who her target was. I wasn't entirely naive or lacking experience, but Abby was incredibly hard to resist. She was 22, I was 28 at the time, and absolutely gorgeous. Her raven black hair was cut fairly short, almost in a boyish style, yet somehow this only made her seem more feminine. She had deep brown eyes that smoldered with sensuality, and though her figure was slender, she had all the right curves in all the right places. At that time, the company was working on a large order to provide green carpeting for some Ministry of Defense sites, and to ensure everything was completed on time, the boss had approved a lot of evening overtime. The looms ran full throttle until midnight, at which point one of the keyholders had to check that everything was shut down and lock up the building. Naturally, as one of the keyholders, I had to do my fair share, although I ended up taking on more shifts than I should have 
because Samantha couldn't possibly cancel her social plans, and the boss was already feeling the effects of the illness that would take his life within a year. It was early December, so plenty of people were eager to work overtime with the promise of a big paycheck before Christmas. That night, the first snowfall of the season began. Snow is rare where we live, so no one is ever prepared for it. Knowing that people might have trouble getting home, I let everyone leave an hour early, then went through the usual closing routine before stepping out into the biting wind and locking up. I was content driving my Land Rover, even though there were already a couple of inches of snow on the roads. As I was leaving the car park, I noticed Abby standing alone at the bus stop, looking a bit down. I pulled up next to her and asked if she was okay. She explained that her ride had canceled because her sister wasn't confident driving in those conditions. I'd seen her sister's car, a Mondeo, and knew that its rear-wheel drive would make it slippery on snow-covered roads, so I offered Abby a lift. She was, of course, thankful, especially since she was freezing, and I let her use my mobile to call her sister and let her know she was fine. On the way to her place, she was still living in the neighborhood where we both grew up. We had a pleasant conversation. She was excited because the foreman had arranged for her to start a new job after the holidays. She would be working as a picker, scanning carpets to fix bad stitches and missing threads by hand. I suppose I flirted a little. I didn't have a girlfriend at the time, and as I've mentioned, she was very attractive, so it felt natural. I think I might have told her that someone as good-looking as her should aim for a more ambitious job. We shared a few laughs, and I enjoyed her company during the 30-minute drive. When we reached her house, she asked if I wanted to come in for a coffee, but I politely declined. Instead, she thanked me with a kiss. Now, there are kisses, and then there are kisses. If I hadn't had my feet on the ground, that kiss would have knocked my shoes and socks off. She clearly knew the effect it had, her huge smile, as she got out of the car and said, Good night, gave that away. I don't think I slept well that night. Over the years, I'd had plenty of chances to have some fun with women at the factory, both single and married. But I'd made it a point to steer clear of those situations. I knew the complications that could arise, especially when one person works on the floor and the other is part of management. So, I did my best to push it out of my mind and kept my distance from her, at least until the last day before the holidays. That day at lunchtime, the machines shut down, and a full Christmas dinner was served in the cafeteria. Naturally, most employees had brought along some refreshing beverages. Spirits were high, as everyone had received their pay, which was inflated with overtime, a bonus for completing the contract early, along with the usual holiday pay and bonus. However, there was a slight unease, since Griffin Lloyd had been hospitalized the day before and I think everyone was a bit worried. The old man was a well-liked employer who treated his staff fairly, but the concern was about who would take over if anything happened to him. The other directors were his wife, who had only been to the factory a handful of times, Samantha, who had fortunately become far less arrogant recently, her husband, who hadn't changed except to fancy himself as an industry leader, with big ideas to revolutionize production, and myself, the company accountant. Apart from us, there were three minor shareholders who only attended board meetings for the free drinks and buffet. So, it's no wonder there was anxiety in the air. Still, the party quickly got into full swing. Eventually, the tables were pushed to the side. A ghetto blaster, remember those, started blasting music and people began to unwind and dance. As usual, I got pulled into it. At my age, being single and earning a good salary, I was considered quite the eligible bachelor, and it was clear some of the women were interested. But they didn't get a chance, because Abby made a beeline for me. The only dances I didn't have with her were with Sammy. 
I'd never seen Sammy at one of these informal parties before, so it was a surprise to find myself dancing closely with her. And an even bigger surprise when, finding ourselves under some mistletoe, she gave me a chaste but very sweet kiss. I was also taken aback when she whispered, Watch out for that one. She's trying to trap you, and you can do a lot better. Then, as the music ended and we stepped apart, Gerald arrived, gave a grand wave, wished everyone a happy holiday, and the two of them disappeared. She was probably right, but I was too naive to realize it. About ten minutes later, Abby came back from wherever she had been and lingered behind, waiting until I was the last one left to lock up. Just as I was about to head out, she suddenly exclaimed, Damn, I forgot my other shoes in the warehouse. She explained that she had left her flats there and had changed into the ones she was wearing for dancing, so I went back inside with her. I think I had a sense of what was about to happen, but truthfully, I wasn't entirely against it. She led me through the rows of carpet rolls until we reached an area where some small rugs were stacked. Her shoes were indeed on the floor in a shopping bag, just as she'd said. Being polite, I bent down to pick them up, and by the time I stood up, she was standing very close, facing me, with one arm raised. It was no surprise that she was holding a sprig of mistletoe. The kiss that followed was even better than our first one. To sum it up briefly and with a bit of humor, although he may not have upset me in the literal sense of the word, he certainly made an impression. I have pleasant memories, so I'm going to be a little nostalgic. She wrapped both arms around my neck, stood on tiptoe to reach my lips, and kissed me. After that, we engaged in intimacy. It was wonderful. Almost immediately, she pushed me aside and reached into her bag for some tissues. As she started cleaning herself quickly, she noticed my look and said, Do you know how much these rugs cost? To the penny, I grinned. I'm an accountant. She then giggled, finished her task, and gave me a very tight hug. That was a bit quick, I'm, I'm sorry. I said, but she kissed me and replied, Don't worry, it's quite flattering, really. But if you want to make it up to me, I won't argue. Just, not here, if you don't mind? Where do you suggest? I asked. Well, I don't really know. My place wouldn't be much fun. Mum and Dad are busy packing to spend Christmas at Auntie Norma's. And my sister and her boyfriend are probably waiting for them to leave so they can head to the bedroom. How about my place? I suggested innocently, unaware that those four words would pretty much seal my fate. To cut to the chase, I took her back to my apartment. A pretty nice two-bedroom with a lovely sea view. And she was quite impressed. After we both showered and spent several hours testing the strength of my large bed, giving me a chance to make up for my earlier haste, she wanted to inspect everything, like someone carefully checking out a place they're considering buying. She had already expressed her satisfaction with the bathroom, which, to be honest, was almost three times larger than in a council house. When I explained the purpose of the bidet to her, she burst out laughing uncontrollably because she had never seen it before. She was also delighted with the spacious wardrobe and storage space in the bedroom, and the kitchen also impressed her. It was filled with gadgets that I rarely used, although I knew how to do it and had an open-plan dining room. She seemed delighted with it, saying that she loves cooking and having such a room was one of her main dreams. However. The view of the living room really took her breath away. I think I was already used to the view, but her reaction made me remember the first time I looked at the bay and watched the tide and the ebb water. Maybe I said something silly about how the view from the window is much better with her. Yes, I admit it, I really said that. And she hugged me, kissed me, and thanked me. Soon we were back under the covers, and she fully expressed her excitement and passed it on to me. The next day was Christmas Eve, and we woke up to find a delicate yet stunning frost covering the ground. After a satisfying session that left us both pleased, 
she insisted on making breakfast, demonstrating her culinary skills, and we ended up sitting at the dining table for a chat. Our conversation soon shifted to our plans for the next day. I intended to have a microwaved meal, watch TV, and perhaps browse the internet. Meanwhile, she was left with the prospect of watching TV while trying to ignore the loud sounds coming from her sister's bedroom. It seemed entirely reasonable to make better plans. I dropped her off at home so she could sort out some clothes while I headed to the supermarket to pick up the groceries she'd asked for to prepare a proper meal for us. It all felt somewhat romantic, perhaps because I managed to overlook that I was being manipulated. We ended up having a fantastic holiday together. We attended a carol service in the town square that evening and enjoyed a bag of roasted chestnuts on our way home. Christmas Day was spent in a passionate frenzy, and on Boxing Day, I took her to the local aero club and explained how skydiving provided the adrenaline rush I needed to counteract the monotony of my work week. She had her doubts, quite serious ones to be honest, but she was up for it, and I admired her for that. Her first jump with a qualified instructor was at the beginning of February. She completed six more jumps by the end of the month, and in early March, she made her first solo descent. It was after she landed that I proposed with an engagement ring. Was it cheesy? Yes. Romantic? Definitely. Unfortunately, it was marred by an idiot who said, Aw, oh, how sweet. The council house kids marry into their own class. Looking around, I saw Gerald Smith's mocking face, and, without pausing to think, I drove my fist into his stomach with all my strength. I heard a whooping sound as the air was forced from his lungs, watched him drop to his knees with a look of utter disbelief, and then heard him heaving as he vomited his recent meal onto the grass. You absolute fool, Samantha said, and I was about to take issue with her until I realized she was speaking to her distressed husband. Sorry about that, Robbie, she said, turning to me. He had a few drinks with his lunch and it's given him verbal diarrhea. Then she spun on her heel and walked away without a backward glance. Abby and I were still in shock, watching her leave, while Gerald staggered to his feet. He wiped some vomit from his sparse goatee and muttered, You've made a big mistake, Davies. One lucky punch doesn't mean this is over, not by any means. Whenever you're ready for more, just let me know. Jerry, I retorted, turning away to find Abby still stunned. I gently took her arm and walked away. The engagement was ruined, but we moved past it and got married a couple of months later. We were uneasy about working together, so after we came back from our honeymoon in Tenerife, Abby resigned and found a job at an employment agency just a short walk from our apartment. Although she had never taken education too seriously, she was smart enough to adapt to an office setting. I didn't want to say it out loud, but I suspected she was hired partly because she made a pleasant impression at the reception desk. The first couple of years seemed to go well for us. We weren't exactly wealthy, but our combined incomes provided us with a comfortable living. My lovely young wife proved to be a great housekeeper and cook, and she was wonderfully inventive in the bedroom. I knew she had some past experiences. She never hid that she had been around a bit before we met, but I had a similar history so I had no complaints on that front. Once we were both properly outfitted for skydiving, the only costs were for the actual jumps, along with occasional replacements and upgrades, of course. We lived very comfortably, though Abby's enthusiasm for new clothes occasionally threatened to get out of hand. We even had minor disagreements about this from time to time. While I usually gave in to her, there were instances where I had to be firm about certain things. At work, things were a bit awkward for me shortly after Griffin Lloyd's passing. Gerald tried to assert his authority, but I knew full well that he held only a nominal amount of shares in the business. Most of them were solely in Samantha's name. Fortunately, the situation came to a head quickly. During a board meeting, Gerald actually tried to have me fired. It was Samantha who put him in his place. Before anyone even considers supporting that move, she said, 
I'll let you know that Robbie taught me everything I know about this business, and to be honest, I believe he's the only one who truly understands how it all works. So, vote however you wish, but as chairperson and majority shareholder, I can assure you that I will veto it. There was a tense silence as the two of them stared each other down for several seconds, and then Gerald backed off. We all knew that Sammy was his lifeline. He had squandered the inheritance his parents left him, and she kept him on a tight leash. I understood he wanted me out of the way, because I was vigilant enough to stop him from accessing the company's financial resources. They stayed behind after everyone else had left, clearly to have a private conversation. But I realized I had left some notes behind and was about to go back for them when I overheard Gerald's voice, raspy with anger. You've always had a soft spot for that damn Davies, haven't you? And I know exactly where that soft spot is. What else did he mentor you in? You act like a dog in heat whenever he's around. At that point, I stopped listening because I didn't want to hear more. I quietly slipped away and went back to the office, unsure of what I had just overheard. As I've mentioned before, Samantha and I hadn't really gotten along when we first worked together. I thought she was irresponsible, and she probably thought I was boring. In fact, due to my background, I'd believed she saw me as too common for her taste, and all the teasing and flirting had seemed like a way to mock me. Could I have been mistaken? It was too late for regrets. Not that I had any, of course, because my marriage was still going well, even if hers didn't seem very happy. I liked her, and she was still stunning. That was as far as it went, but it certainly gave me something to think about. I mentioned the board meeting to Abel that night, but I was relieved that I hadn't shared with him what Gerald said later, because Abby suddenly cut me off with the words, Be careful with this arrogant woman. I always suspected that he was attracted to you. More than anything, she would like to get her claws into you. That sounded familiar. And if she ever does, I will not only scratch out her eyes, I'll also do something for you. So... So you're definitely not interested in a threesome? I asked. For a moment, I thought she might actually do something to me, but then she saw the look on my face, burst out laughing, and called me a pig, as well as a few other words that I can't quite remember right now. As you can see, things were going quite well for me at that time. I had a stable job that, while a bit mundane, was well-paying and secure. I was married to a beautiful and loving wife, and if the rumors were to be believed, there was a wealthy and attractive woman interested in me. Additionally, I had the resources to indulge in a hobby that truly excited me. I'm not entirely sure when things began to deteriorate. It was probably some time before I even noticed, but deteriorate they did. My first sign that something was off came when Abby abruptly lost her passion for skydiving. It wasn't a gradual decline, it was as sudden as flipping a switch. That summer, we'd enjoyed some fantastic weather, providing us with numerous chances to jump out of planes and experience the thrill of falling at around 120 miles per hour. I understand it might sound risky, especially considering there are 50 to 70 fatalities reported each year. While many believe equipment failure is common, it's not. Most accidents result from simple mistakes. For those properly trained, the fatality rate is about 1 in 100,000 jumps. To put that in perspective, if you drive 10,000 miles annually, your chance of dying in a car accident in a given year is roughly 1 in 6,000. Abby was aware of these statistics. We had discussed them frequently. Yet she started to claim for reasons unknown, that the risk of accidents and fatalities was significantly higher for women than for men. As a result, she decided to stop. Her last jump had been the tandem dive we did together on her 24th birthday, a couple of months after our first anniversary. Initially, she came along to watch, possibly to keep an eye on Samantha more than anything else. After a few weeks, she confessed that watching was more nerve-wracking than actually participating, so she decided to stay behind while I went alone. I was more than willing to quit, if she preferred, 
but she insisted she wanted me to continue as long as I enjoyed it. What was surprising was that during the second week Samantha came to watch, she was also on her own. Apparently, Gerald had hurt his back from falling off a horse and would need a long time to recover before he could strap on a parachute again. However, Abby didn't seem to mind that Samantha and I were both without company. So, I continued with my hobby, and Samantha became my usual companion instead of my wife. Now don't get the wrong idea. By this time, Samantha and I were getting along very well. She had changed completely from the snobbish person I first met, and in addition to becoming a skilled businesswoman, she was a lot of fun. We had many laughs and got along great, but that was all. Did I have feelings for her? You bet I did. Did she have feelings for me? I was pretty sure she did. Were either of us likely to act on it? Not a chance. We became very close friends, talked a lot, and sometimes confided in each other. So, one Sunday afternoon, when we had enjoyed some pleasant thermal currents that let us float in the air for a long time instead of descending quickly, I was puzzled by why she looked so down afterward. We were sitting in the small clubhouse, enjoying some cool, soft drinks. They wouldn't serve any alcohol until all the flights for the day had been completed, and I tried to find out what was troubling her. Initially, she insisted that nothing was wrong, but after a bit of gentle questioning and a lot of patience, she finally admitted, Okay, Robbie, what would you do if you suspected your partner was cheating on you? What? You mean, I don't know, really I don't, she insisted, but I think Gerald might be having an affair. Good heavens, really? I responded surprised and unsure if I wanted to delve deeper. Yes, really, she said with a strained smile. Then she continued, Look, Robbie, I don't want to be a bother, but I need to talk to someone I can trust and, well, there aren't many people I can think of right now. Oh, surely. No, I mean it. At work, people are a bit intimidated by who I am, and I've grown increasingly disillusioned with our so-called social circle over the years. I suppose many women in my position would turn to their mothers, but let's not go there. That brought a slight smirk to my face. Her mother had always been more concerned with social status than anything else. From what I gathered, she had strongly pushed for Samantha and Gerald to be together because he came from a proper family, one with old money that would add a touch of respectability to their newly acquired wealth. I had actually been worried that the old witch would end up with a controlling share when her husband passed away, especially since I'd had a couple of unpleasant encounters with her in the past. So I just nodded in understanding. You're one of the few who has ever treated me the way I deserved, Robbie. No, don't deny it. When I used to act like a nightmare at the office, you were always willing to call me out and put me in my place, even though you did it with a gentle hand. You also knew how to give praise when, on rare occasions, I earned it. You may speak softly, Robbie, but you don't let anyone walk all over you. You handle problems in your own quiet way. You don't run to others with complaints, and I know for sure that you're not interested in gossip or scandal. There are so many other things, too, Robbie. And, honestly, I've come to see you as someone I can trust. In fact, you're probably the only one I can trust. Wow, I'm flattered, I replied, probably sounding a bit sarcastic, but when I noticed her eyes were glistening with unshed tears, I continued, Look, I'm your friend, Sammy. I wouldn't have said that when we first met. You were a real pain back then. But you've changed a lot since those days. Honestly, a lot. If there's anything I can do to help you, well, you know, I finished awkwardly. What I need is for you to promise not to tell anyone what I'm about to say, Robbie. Can you do that? I started to nod, but she added, not even Abby, and I had to pause for a moment. I don't like keeping secrets, but as long as it didn't directly affect her, I figured it wouldn't do any harm. So I finally agreed 
and gave her my word that it would stay between us. Even though no one was nearby, she lowered her voice as she began. You've probably noticed that things aren't as they should be between me and Gerald. And since you're not a fool, you've probably realized that we haven't been happy together for a while now. Maybe I was naive, but it simply never crossed my mind. I couldn't stand the man. I thought he was a pretentious, lazy, and utterly unpleasant person. But I don't usually concern myself with judging other couples' happiness. It's never seemed like my place. So I stayed quiet and let her continue. Initially, everything seemed fine. We appeared to be equals, you know. My dad was never fully convinced about Gerald, but Mum thought he was perfect. She used to say, At least you can be sure he isn't just after your money. But she was wrong, Robbie. It didn't take long to realize that he was nearly broke when we got married, but, well, you know how it goes. He fed me some story about bad luck with supposedly secure investments, about being betrayed by dishonest partners, all kinds of excuses. Of course, I was still in love with him, and I guess I was a bit naive. I believed everything, hook, line, and sinker. It didn't take long for Daddy to figure him out. He gave him easy jobs that he couldn't mess up and paid him more than they were worth. But he made me promise not to let Gerald waste what Dad had worked so hard to provide. Before the end of our first year together, I found out he was cheating. There was a secretary at a law firm that he took out when he claimed to be entertaining clients. Remember when you questioned his expenses? He was terrified you'd bring it up to me. But you never did. You didn't have to. He was scared enough to drop her, and that gave him another reason to resent you, Robbie. So, since I didn't tell you, I asked. I found out by going through your notes. Oh, I know no one usually checks them. Who would go through everything an accountant writes? But you were always very thorough. I remember you telling me how important that was in business, so I went through them. Don't feel bad, Robbie. I already knew about that one. Y your notes just confirmed it. Anyway, there were others after that. I could never prove any of them, of course. But at least he stopped trying to use the company account to fund his affairs. He denied everything when I confronted him, of course. He just claimed that as head of sales, he had to do a lot of after-hours entertaining. That was never more than a token position. I said quietly. I eventually realized that. It was just something my dad gave him to make it look like he was contributing. I know now that it was Freddie Watson who brought in most of the new business. She paused, so I stepped in and asked, If you knew he was having affairs, why did you tolerate it? And why have you suddenly decided to act now? I tolerated it, she said quietly partly because I couldn't bear the conflict it would cause with my mother, but also because I didn't want to share the same bed with him anymore. We had a huge fight because of some really strange... Well, I won't get into that. Let's just say it was a massive argument, and now we mostly sleep in separate rooms. As for your second question, all of those affairs he had were brief and clearly not that important to him. Mostly, they were with the wives of friends. I think he got some kind of thrill from it. It probably fed his superiority complex or whatever it was. Or maybe he was just trying to mask his insecurities by racking up a bunch of conquests. Anyway, it was pretty obvious they didn't mean much to him. But, well, whatever he's involved in now seems much more serious. How can you tell? I asked. It all started when he began spending an unreasonable amount of time on his computer. When I checked it out, I found all sorts of things protected by passwords. That worried me a bit. I tried to convince myself that he was just watching adult movies and didn't want me to find out about it. But it kept bothering me until, well, this might sound a bit, you know. But I got an old school friend who's a bit of a tech genius to help me hack into it. I didn't tell her the real reason, of course. I just said it belonged to someone I suspected of leaking our contract quotes to a competitor. Anyway, she added some clever little device, 
and about a week later she came back, removed it, and handed me a list of all the passwords. She made it seem so easy. So, once I had them, it didn't take long to discover that there were emails going back and forth between Gerald and some woman calling herself Mrs. Hot and Wet. I downloaded and read them all. There are hundreds, and they go back over six months. Well, most of them, especially the earlier ones, were just what you'd expect. You know, there were the usual mushy love notes, but then there were plenty of vulgar ones about what they wanted to do together and how much they'd enjoy it. Those really made me cringe. I mean, I'm not a prude, Robbie, but still. I'm sorry, Sammy, I said, as she pulled out a small handkerchief and tried to wipe away her tears as discreetly as possible. The thing is, Robbie, I could have dealt with all that. In a way, I was relieved that he had someone else to indulge his disgusting, well, you know, it meant I didn't have to. But lately, the most recent messages have started to scare me. They've begun talking about how they'll soon be free to be together. They keep mentioning some kind of plan to get rid of me and her husband, although they're vague about the details. In a few of them, she even reminds him that everything has to be in writing so he can't ditch her once she helps him get his fortune. I'm really scared, Robbie. I'm terrified. Why haven't you gone to the police? I asked. Because I'd probably just end up looking like a fool. If they had to, they'd probably claim it was just some kind of game, some twisted turn-on. They could argue that it was nothing more than online chat, just fantasies, and nothing ever actually happened. And anyway, there's no direct threat to me, is there? Not really, if you think about it. And you've no idea who this woman is? No. I haven't a clue. At first, I thought it might be one of the women on our fundraising committee for the local hospice. I know she has a thing for Gerald, but I ruled her out when I saw one of the reports she wrote. Whoever Mrs. Hot and Wet is, she almost always mixes up the E and I in words like relief. And she never uses capital letters. I think, at that moment, some of the other members joined us still buzzing from their adrenaline rush and ready to chat endlessly about the thrill of soaring through the sky, so we had to drop the conversation. Eventually, I had to leave, and I just said, take care of yourselves, to all of them. But Sammy knew I was really directing it at her. I was lost in thought as I drove home, and to be honest, if I hadn't promised Samantha, I wondered if I might have talked it over with Abby. Then again, maybe not because we were going through what some married couples might call a bit of a rough patch at the time. After our first few months together, I discovered two things about Abby that I didn't particularly like. First, she had a tendency to flirt with other men. It wasn't a big issue. It was just that she seemed to attract them effortlessly. Once she locked her smoldering brown eyes on them, they turned into eager puppies craving her attention. I couldn't really fault her for enjoying the attention, especially if the guy was attractive and she never crossed any lines. By that, I mean she was always quick to introduce me as her husband and made sure I was fully included in any conversation that followed. Still, it often made me uncomfortable the way they looked at her, and then at me, with a look that said, I wish you weren't here, buddy. We talked about it a few times, but she always said the same things. It doesn't mean anything. He was just flirting with me. I didn't invite him over. Do you want me to be rude to him? Don't you like it when other men find me attractive? I wasn't exactly showing off any cleavage, and my skirt was a decent length. And if I was still unhappy, she would say, For crying out loud, Robbie. Do you want me to wear a burqa when we go out? So I decided to deal with it, more or less. I still wasn't thrilled about it and made my feelings clear, and she began to show a lot more restraint. Things settled down for a week or two, but the issue flared up again on the day my car was in for servicing, and she came to pick me up from work. If I had been in my own office, I wouldn't have seen her arrive and park by the employee's entrance, 
but I happened to be in Freddie Watson's office, discussing a large contract he was pursuing in Belgium and trying to find a way to reduce transportation costs. Fortunately, he had his back to the window, so I was the only one who saw her get out of the little Mazda MX-5 she adored, and she was greeted by three guys she used to work with. It's one thing to greet old colleagues with a smile or maybe even a quick kiss on the cheek, but that's not all. Each of them received a kiss on the lips while they hugged her tightly. One of them even snuggled up to her. I finished my business with Freddy as quickly as I could and rushed to the main entrance, just as she pulled up and parked in the reserved space for me. I don't make hasty judgments, which is probably why I'm one of the few people in the neighborhood who managed to grow up and not get into trouble. So I took a kiss on the cheek when I got into the car and calmly thought about it as we drove home. I casually asked her if she had just arrived, and when she replied that she had, I understood what I needed to do. She was shocked and speechless when I told her what I had seen. Naturally, she tried to brush it off, saying that they were just old friends, but I lost my temper, which she had never seen before. I don't care who they were or what they meant to you, I yelled. I don't even care that they probably slept with you long before me. If I ever see you acting like that with any man again, just once more, you will walk out the door and go back to your parents before. Am I making myself clear? There were a lot of tears that night before going to bed, but I tried to make her understand that I was sincere in everything I said. Then there was the second question. It was about what we were doing in the bedroom. The closeness was amazing. Of course, there were times when we were not in the mood, but such cases were quite rare. Over time, however, she began to want more. We found a temporary solution by ordering an adult toy for her from an online store. She liked it so much that I joked that we should start buying batteries in bulk to save money. Then she started reading stories on the internet and sharing them with me. At first it was just stories about couples having fun together. They were wonderful. We even learned something. But after a while, she started talking about stories related to adultery. I didn't like them too much, and as soon as she noticed it, she switched to stories about exchanges, open marriages, wife separation, and similar topics. It wasn't entirely convenient for me either, but at least they didn't have that kind of deception in them, and at least she found a site where some of them were written well enough to seem plausible. Naturally, I asked her if she liked these stories, and after several rejections, she eventually admitted that she had used some of them as fantasies when we were together. Although it may seem strange to some, it didn't bother me much. The problem arose when she began to misunderstand my acceptance. The questions gradually shifted towards whether I would enjoy watching her with someone else or whether I was interested in dancing with another couple. She gave the impression that she was just following my example not guiding me to something. But when she finally went too far one night, and I told her that if these stories made her think like that, maybe it was better to stop reading them. I think she realized that I just wasn't cut out for it. That's when she started buying toys. She explained that it was because she wanted to make sure that we would never get bored with each other. She wanted to be the perfect professional at work the perfect cook in the kitchen, and the one in bed so that I would never have the desire to deviate. I couldn't argue with that, except to insist that I was quite happy with the way things were going. For several weeks, I never knew what would arrive in the mail every day. Of course, there were all kinds of underwear. After that, leather corsets and boots appeared. But then she bought a riding crop and asked me to use them. Trying to please her and not wanting to seem too conservative, I did everything I could, but I never really put my heart into it. Either I was too gentle or too rude, because I wasn't really interested, although, I have to admit, she seemed to like it. However, that Saturday, when I returned home from the skydiving club, I heard her call me and say she was waiting in the bedroom. It sounded promising, especially since I was having an amazing day, and the idea of having fun in the bedroom was definitely appealing until I got there. 
She was wearing a leather corset, fishnet underwear, which turned into high-heeled leather boots. There was nothing wrong with that. In fact, she looked incredibly attractive. But then I noticed that she had a riding crop in one hand and a pair of handcuffs with something like a fur lining in the other. Come on, mister, she growled. I'm going to tie you to the bed and give you an unforgettable ride. No, I answered. It seemed like I had nothing more to say. I said it softly because she obviously put a lot of effort into organizing this, but I had no idea what made her think I would be involved in this. I'm not asking you. I'm telling you. Now do as I say, she growled, throwing the handcuffs on the bed and tapping her whip on her arm, trying to look dominant and intimidating. I glanced at her briefly and said I was hungry. If she hasn't cooked anything, I'll order the food myself. For a moment, she seemed stunned, as if she couldn't believe I was turning her down. Then her expression turned fierce, her breathing was rapid and uneven, and she started screaming hysterically at me. Suddenly, I was portrayed as a control freak who was spoiling all her fun. She accused me of being too boring to try something new. I was labeled an insensitive and boring person. She claimed that I was afraid to explore new pleasures and did not want to share my fantasies. At that moment, I calmly turned away, asked her to put on something decent and went downstairs to order a pizza. I didn't see her for the rest of the evening and nothing was decided in the following months. I've tried to discuss this several times, explaining that I just don't like being tied up or tying her up or experiencing pain in any form. She complained, you don't want to try anything, and how do you know you won't like it if you don't even try it? Then she said, all you've ever wanted is a little foreplay and simple intimacy. To be honest, there was some truth in this. I really enjoyed the foreplay. I could even agree that a little imagination would be nice. Was it my fault that I didn't want to turn fantasies into reality? These conversations always ended the same way. This went on for several months, intermittently, and there were many moments in between. But I never knew what her mood would be next. I was already starting to think that if the situation didn't improve soon, then maybe it would be better for both of us to end our marriage. No matter how much I wanted it, and no matter how hard I tried to convince myself that there was still a lot of love between us, I knew it couldn't go on forever, so it seemed unlikely that I would come home and talk to Abby about Samantha's problem that day. The more I thought about it, the more convinced I became that it was pointless to wait and that it would be better to convince her to call the police and at least document her concerns. When I got home that Sunday night, Abby wasn't there. I vaguely remembered that she said she could visit her mom, so her absence was not unexpected. As usual, I took the ready meals out of the freezer and put them in the microwave. Then I called her on her cell phone and found out that she had gone for a drink at the Forester's Arms with her sister. It was quiet there, although I could hear her sister's loud voice in the background. She told me she would be home in a couple of hours, and after I advised her not to drive, she promised to call me when she needed a ride. With nothing else to do, I decided to go online for a bit and check the day's sports results. I used Abby's laptop since mine was still in its case in the car. I booted it up, found the information I needed, and then began browsing through the various folders. One folder was labeled Bits and Bobs, and when I opened it, it contained hundreds of icons and almost as many subfolders. Since I had accessed it before, I knew it was a mishmash of everything from old photos to half-written stories that she'd abandoned. There were also several stories that she downloaded from one of her favorite websites. Knowing this, I had started to use it to gauge her reading habits, hoping to predict what might come next. The most recent additions indicated that she had read a lot of stories about loving wives, which, as far as I found out, were mostly about unfaithful wives and cuckolds. I sighed, thinking that this wasn't helping her address our issues. 
Then I noticed a file that seemed completely out of place. It was named System Info, so I clicked on it and found a subfolder marked Do Not Change, which led to another and another folder until I finally reached one with a warning that opening it could damage the computer. Anyone with a bit of common sense would know that a warning like that is likely exaggerated, and it turned out to be the case. After navigating through three more subfolders, I found a link to an email icon. Without hesitation, I clicked it and wasn't surprised to find it was password protected. I stared at it for a moment, then, as if it was the most natural thing in the world, I typed Mrs. Shot and Wet, and it opened. Sammy mentioned that there were no capital letters used and that the spelling of words with I was incorrect, both mistakes that Abby often made. That's exactly what I discovered. It took me quite a while to do what I believed was necessary, even though I barely looked at the explicit photos she had occasionally convinced me to take or the ones she had taken herself. I only just managed to finish my task and erase any trace of my work before shutting down the computer when the phone rang. With a resigned sigh, I got into my car and headed to pick her up from the pub. His name was Joe. He worked at the factory and was 28 years old. This was, I believe, only his seventh solo jump, and he screamed like a banshee until he hit the ground. Then there was an eerie silence, the most profound I've ever experienced, as everyone stood in shock, staring at the spot where he had fallen with a thud that we all swore we had heard. The first to move were the saints, John's ambulance crew, who were always present at our meetings. In the past, they dealt with a few ankle injuries from clumsy landings and a couple of cuts and bruises, but they, like the rest of us, had never encountered anything like this. They rushed to the scene with their blue lights flashing uselessly. My immediate thought was to hope that the fall had killed him instantly. The only other possibility was that he would be in a terrible state for the rest of his life. I had witnessed his fall. I don't usually pay much attention, but he was one of Abby's friends, one she had managed to persuade to come along, probably by daring them, to provide some livelier company on the duller afternoons, so I clearly saw what had happened. Skydivers fear one malfunction more than any other known as a horseshoe. Simply put, this happens when a parachute deploys but remains attached to the skydiver by its risers and at least one other point preventing the canopy from opening fully and resulting in a horseshoe shape formed by the canopy and lines. This typically occurs when the closing pin of the rig detaches from the closing loop, allowing the deployment bag to separate from the container. In some cases, it's possible to handle this situation like any other high-speed malfunction by releasing the main canopy and deploying the reserve. However, Often the pilot chute shifts during the entanglement, and as the skydiver falls, the AAD, automatic activation device, on the reserve engages, causing a tangle between the two. This usually leads to a fatal encounter with the ground. While it's not a common occurrence and can be practiced on the ground, dealing with it while free-falling is vastly different, and there's no guarantee that training will be remembered in a moment of panic. An hour earlier, Joe had been chatting with Samantha and me in the kit room. He showed her a level of respect that bordered on deference, while barely concealing his disdain for me. I understood his feelings well enough, but as I watched the ambulance rush towards his unmoving figure, I wasn't about to dwell on that. At the moment, my focus was on trying to comfort Sammy. She was pressing her head against my chest, sobbing and trembling just shy of hysteria. It was completely understandable. Witnessing someone fall like that was traumatic enough, but it was undoubtedly worse for the person who had given him her parachute. It could have been me, Robbie, she sobbed weakly. It could have been... Shh. It's all right, I murmured soothingly, my left arm around her shoulders and my right hand gently stroking her beautiful blonde hair. I could feel every shiver of her body as she clung to me, seeking solace in our embrace. 
We probably stayed like that for several minutes before I finally managed to pry myself away and gently lower her onto one of the benches at the front of the clubhouse. She was sobbing, saying, It's all my fault. I shouldn't have... But then a new wave of tears cut off the rest of her sentence. I was about to sit down and dispel any such notions when I noticed Mark Haley approaching out of the corner of my eye. Actually, it was Detective Sergeant Mark Haley, to use his full title, and his arrival was very welcome. Like me, Mark was one of the few from our old neighborhood who hadn't gone to the dark side. And like me, he was a committee member of the Skydiving Club. Although he was a good bit older, probably in his late forties, he was genuinely a nice guy, and we'd always gotten along well. Who was it? Robbie? He asked without preamble. The Rota said it was you and Sammy. What happened? We swapped with Joe and Donald. We updated the manifest, I explained. Don's using my shoot, and Joe's using Sammy's. But there's something more pressing than that, Mark. He raised his eyebrows slightly, prompting me to continue. I don't think this was an accident. I have good reason to believe it might have been deliberate and needs investigation. You should have your team come out here to secure the evidence or whatever it is they do. They're already on their way, he assured me. Do I understand that you know something I don't about this? We both do, I said, nodding toward Sammy. But you'd be better off talking to me for now. Poor Sammy's in shock. As it turned out, Everyone was required to provide initial statements about what we had witnessed and what we knew about the accident. Mark and his superior, Detective Inspector Kelsey, set up in the small room usually reserved for committee meetings, and we were brought in one by one to recount our version of events. The aerodrome had been sealed off during the incident, and even though those who had given statements were allowed to leave, no one from outside was permitted to enter the premises until the process was complete. While waiting, I sat by one of the windows and observed the activity outside. There wasn't much to see. Several people in CSI coveralls were busy around the area where Joe had landed, while another group was inspecting the finnest SMG-92 set, the plane that had likely taken him on what might have been his final journey. There was still some debate about his fate, as a rumor quickly spread suggesting he might still be alive, albeit barely. This rumor probably stemmed from the way the ambulance had rushed away, with its sirens blaring and lights flashing, though I suspected the St. John's personnel were just as shocked as the rest of us. Samantha was on the opposite side of the room, being comforted by a female police officer, and it was hard to tell if she was awake or asleep since she hardly moved at all. Mark had organized everything efficiently. The first individuals called in were those who hadn't seen much of what happened, and their statements were processed relatively quickly. Then came those who had been outside and had witnessed the figure screaming and flailing in terror as it descended towards the ground and eventually towards the plane's pilot. After the pilot's statement, Samantha was assisted into the room by her companion. I knew her interview would take longer than the others, so I settled in to wait. When I was younger, I used to smoke, though not heavily. I never exceeded ten cigarettes a day and had found it fairly easy to quit. However, as I sat there alone, except for the uniformed constable stationed near the exit, I experienced my first craving for nicotine in many years. We were instructed to turn off our phones, so I had no way of contacting anyone outside. I assumed by now the news would have spread, and I could only imagine the concerns of friends and family of those scheduled to jump this afternoon. After what felt like nearly an hour, Samantha finally arrived. She looked pale and trembled, and it seemed like she might have fallen without the policewoman's support. The officer glanced at me and asked, Mr. Davies? I nodded, and she said, You can go in now. As I stood up, Samantha, with her bloodshot eyes, said, I'm not going home, Robbie. I'll be checking into a hotel for now. 
Can you call my mobile when you're free? Please? I could only nod. Her condition made me feel awful, and I feared I'd break down if I tried to speak. I entered the committee room and saw three people sitting along one side of the table. I took a seat and was introduced to each of them. D.C. Robertson then began by asking for my full name, address, date of birth, and so forth. He then inquired if I was an official of the club, and I informed him that I was the treasurer. Despite being informed that the interview was being recorded and shown the equipment, he still took note of everything. Then it was Mark's turn. Robbie, could you just go over your qualifications, specifically the skydiving ones? Well, I've completed an ICC, sorry. That's an instructor certification course. But I've only had it for a few months. I need to hold it for at least a year alongside my jump master qualification before I can become an instructor. I also have a senior riggers certificate that lets me make minor repairs and pack both reserve and main parachutes. If you need details about all my jumps and so forth, they're in my logbook. But I can tell you, that's fine, Robbie, Mark cut in. And then D.I. Kelsey, in an unexpectedly gentle tone, asked, So, Mr. Lloyd, does this mean you pack the parachutes? Sometimes. The instructor prefers to pack his own and those for his students, as you might know. I always pack mine and my wife's, and recently I've packed Samantha's a couple of times. Did you prepare it for her today? Kelsey asked, giving what he likely intended to be an intimidating stare. No. She brought it already packed and ready. I assume her husband did it. You'd have to ask her about that. But he has the qualification and always did it until he stopped coming recently after his injury. Look, speaking of her husband, can we... We're aware of the situation, Robbie, Mark reassured me. Samantha filled us in on the details. You don't need to worry about that now. We'd like to focus on what happened and what you actually witnessed. So, with just a few clarifying questions, I explained how I'd arrived at the club earlier that day. I first checked what time my call was, the time to board the plane. Then I went through the usual routine, checking the AGL altitude for the jump, the jump path, the wind line, the upper air speeds, and all the other necessary details. I had seen Sammy arrive and went over to meet her to share the information I had, but she seemed preoccupied with something else. She mentioned wanting to have a private conversation with me about a personal issue. What personal issue was that? D.I. Kelsey interjected. Well, I can't be entirely sure. We hadn't really had much chance for privacy before the, well, you know. But I have a pretty good idea of what it was about. For some reason, they brushed that aside and asked me to continue from where I left off. There wasn't much more to add. I had gone into the office and altered the manifest so we wouldn't be jumping at the scheduled time. There were a couple of slots available later, so I requested to be penciled in for those. Sammy and I had just bought some lemonades and were sitting at a quiet table when Joe and his friend, Donald, came over. They mentioned they'd heard we weren't going at the scheduled time and asked if they could borrow our parachutes. I asked if there were any available among the guests. Usually there are quite a few, and they're always in date. But there was some sort of party or team-building event going on, and none would be repacked in time. So Sammy offered hers to Joe, and I let Donald use mine. I knew we'd have plenty of time to repack them before our turn. Can you explain why Joe wasn't attached to the, what do you call it, static line? Kelsey asked. He was a Category 3, I explained, so he's allowed to pull the ripcord himself. But he shouldn't have waited as long as he did. You have to be a Category 4 to wait 10 seconds to pull it. To be honest, and without wanting to speak ill, I've heard he might be a bit of a sky god. Basically a bit of a show-off, Mark said after Kelsey raised his eyebrows. Someone who tries to perform beyond their actual experience. There were a few more questions about what I had seen, which was probably no more than anyone else who had been there. 
Then the questions took a different turn. How well do you know Joseph Carpenter, Mr. Davies? Kelsey asked, and I noticed he phrased it in the present tense. So I responded, Well, he works at the carpet factory, so I know him enough to talk to. I can't say I know him particularly well. He's only been there a couple of years, and I mostly work in the office now. So, you're his boss? I suppose I am, sort of, but not directly. There are supervisors for each section and a foreman in charge of the whole workshop. I'm just part of the management team. There was a moment of silence as the DC caught up with the note-taking, and then I noticed a silent exchange between Mark and Kelsey, as if they were communicating without words, until the senior officer finally sighed deeply. Looking directly at me, he asked, Mr. Davies, were you aware that Joseph Carpenter had an affair with your wife? For a brief moment, I could only stare back at him in shock. I'm sure he saw the astonishment on my face as I struggled to respond. I'm sorry? What did you say? He was the first to break the eye contact, glancing awkwardly at his notes before saying, According to several people, they were involved before and after your marriage, and it apparently ended earlier this year. Were you aware of this? I was at a loss for words, my emotions a turbulent mix of confusion, pain, and disbelief, all too evident to the others in the room. I shut my eyes, letting my chin drop to my chest. When I opened them again, I saw a bottle of water being offered to me and heard Mark's voice saying, Sorry, Robbie. If you didn't know, this is a hell of a way to find out. But who, I mean, how, I can't believe it. I knew they were friends, but, take it easy, Robbie, Mark said soothingly. I'm surprised you didn't know, to be honest. I'm not saying it was common knowledge, but apparently, he used to brag about it to his colleagues. He said his job would always be safe because, well, anyway. No, don't stop there. Tell me, why? Well, he seemed to think you knew about it and didn't mind because he could, um, satisfy her needs in a way you couldn't. That's absurd, I nearly shouted, standing up so abruptly that my chair toppled over with a loud crash. There's no way that... Please, sit down, Mr. Davies, Kelsey said firmly, and the young note-taker came around to pick up my chair. I didn't just sit. I more or less collapsed into it. They began asking about how well I knew Abby before we were married, and honestly, I didn't have much to say. I knew she had a bit of a reputation, but I hadn't delved into it. The past didn't concern me, and we never discussed it. Once we were together, it didn't seem to matter. Strangely, despite my efforts to downplay their boasting, I didn't question the truth of what they were saying. I noticed their slightly pitying expressions and eventually fell silent. I hope you understand, the inspector said, that we have a very good reason for questioning you, Mr. Davies. Someone who was recently involved with your wife has just fallen from about 4,000 feet, possibly due to a fault in a parachute belonging to a close friend of yours. I'm sure my face drained of color as I grasped what he was implying. I didn't pack it, I pointed out. And before you ask, I didn't handle it after Sammy arrived. It stayed with her the whole time. Did she take it with her when she went to the ladies' room, Mr. Davies? But, but I didn't, I protested. I mean, I wouldn't have done that. This is ridiculous. There were other people there. They would have seen. She was only gone for a minute or two. It's okay, Robbie. Mark said, noticing my voice rising. We're not accusing you of anything. Please understand that we need to ask these questions. Maybe you can explain why you thought it wasn't an accident. I did my best to relay exactly what Samantha had shared with me about the emails she'd come across. I mentioned that I had strongly advised her to report them to the police, but was unsure if she had followed through. I described the company's financial situation. Gerald had only his salary to manage, 
and if he and Samantha had split up, he would likely be out of work and struggle to find a decent job due to a lack of significant experience on his CV. The inspector then asked, What would Gerald's situation be if Mrs. Lloyd Smith had been involved in the incident today? I can't say for sure, I replied cautiously. Why not? Well, I'm not sure if Sammy made a will or anything. Let's assume she hasn't. In that case, I said, after a moment of consideration, he'd probably be quite wealthy. Besides the factory, there are three successful retail carpet stores operating under a different name, plus many solid investments made by her father. I would assume it would all go to him. They inquired about the potential value of her estate, and when I provided a fairly conservative estimate, their astonishment was evident. I was relieved to see the focus of their questions shift to Gerald. I was completely honest about my disdain for him, even recounting the story of how I had punched him. I didn't want to hide anything that they might eventually discover. I have no idea how long the interrogation lasted. It felt like an eternity. Eventually, they decided to pause for now. As the light outside began to fade, they asked me to come to the police station the next morning with several other relevant witnesses. As I awkwardly got to my feet, Inspector Kelsey remarked, Just one more thing, Mr. Davies. If I had anticipated a deep, Columbo-style question, I was let down. Instead, he asked the usual question posed to skydiving enthusiasts, and I gave him the typical answer that most of us provide. How can a rational person do what you do? Why would you jump out of a plane while it's still in the sky? Because the door's open, I replied. The investigation took some time. As Mark informed me, Detective Inspector Kelsey was meticulous and thorough, never rushing through his work. Initially, both Samantha and I faced a lot of suspicion. The data card on her parachute, containing details like the reserve parachutes type last packed date, owner, and serial number, seemed to suggest it had been repacked the week before she returned home, with my signature on the process. Sam's husband initially corroborated this, claiming I usually handled it for her and that he hadn't touched it for weeks. He spun a tale that Sammy and I were having an affair and that she had begun blackmailing me to divorce Abby. He alleged that Sammy declared she wanted me more than anything, and, being the spoiled rich woman she was, was determined to get her way. He claimed she even offered him a significant financial settlement to agree to a divorce. As a devoted husband, his first concern was his wife. He attempted to warn her that people like me, those who grew up in tough environments, were dangerous. He told her we were capable of anything, but she ignored his warnings, having always gotten what she wanted and pushed people around. This defense was weak at best. Once forensics verified that the handwriting on the data card wasn't mine, it was completely debunked. With suspicion now firmly on him, Gerald grew increasingly desperate to escape responsibility. He denied attempting to murder his wife for financial gain and also denied Samantha's claim of emails to a mysterious woman who allegedly helped him plan her downfall. She hadn't had the chance to obtain copies, as I suggested. When his laptop was examined, it was found to be new and almost unused. He explained that he had simply updated it and donated his old one to a charity for the elderly. This turned out to be true, but by the time the old laptop was traced to a new owner, it had a new hard drive and was useless as evidence. Once again, lacking solid evidence against him, he tried to shift the blame back to Samantha. He admitted to a few brief affairs, but claimed this was because Samantha lost interest in intimacy after the first few weeks of marriage, mainly because she was probably getting what she needed from me. The very idea of a mysterious woman offering all sorts of services, as Sammy claimed was described in the emails, was absurd. He'd never considered doing any of those things and actually found them quite repulsive. The investigation seemed to have stalled, despite it becoming clear that the parachute had been rigged to fail and someone had deliberately tried to end Samantha's life. 
I did appreciate how the police meticulously continued their work, repeatedly going over the evidence and interviewing us each time something new emerged. But real progress was elusive. By that time, of course, I was living alone. When I got home after the accident that night, I found Abby had been drinking heavily. As soon as I walked in, she hugged me, relieved that I was okay. Apparently, the local radio had reported a fatal accident at the skydiving club, but hadn't released the details of who had died. I should mention that Joe had died instantly from the fall. Unfortunately, when the St. John's crew arrived, they thought they detected some movement. Whether it was just the body settling or gases escaping is unclear. One of the crew attempted CPR. The rule is that once CPR is started, it must continue until a doctor confirms death. Thus, even though the radio news might have been premature, they were technically correct. At the time, Abby had no idea who the victim was, and that was her first question. I shook my head, headed to the bathroom, and told her to return to the living room and pour me a drink. I also asked her to wait, promising I'd come out shortly to give her all the information she needed. When I rejoined her, about ten minutes later, she was engrossed in the television news and watching a short clip from her mobile phone in which Joe was rushing to meet his fate. From this distance, it was impossible to determine who it was or even his gender, so it was understandable why she said, this is Samantha's parachute, because Sammy's parachute was very unusual, custom-made. Yes, it was, I grumbled, and she turned to me as I stepped forward to grab a glass of 12-year-old Tullamore Dew Irish whiskey. Oh my God, I'm sorry, Robbie. I mean, I didn't like her, but... But she didn't use it, I said coldly, staring at her intently. Then, who... Who was it? What is it? She asked, her hand trembling, clutching a tall glass of whiskey cola, and her brown eyes, the eyes that I once loved so much widened. I continued, That was the one you cheated on me with. What? What do you mean? What is it? She stammered. It was Joe Carpenter, I said slowly, watching her face contort and tears run down her cheeks. Eventually, she managed to look away and mutter that he was a good guy and that it was all a long time ago. I don't think a couple of months is that long ago, Abby, I replied quietly, noticing how she flinched, trying to deny it. I don't understand what you're talking about, she said. I often saw him when we worked at the factory. There has never been anything serious. Then as she often did, when cornered, she tried to dodge. Anyway, the poor guy just died, damn it. Can't you show some... A little bit of what, Abby? I growled. Respect? Do you like the respect you show me? I don't really know what you're talking about. Stop it! I shouted, and she fell silent, realizing the depth of my anger. You slept with him and several others at the factory before you fell for me. So don't lie to me. And you started seeing him again, regularly, shortly after we got married. I'm done with it, Robbie. I swear I was. I told him that it was over between us. Because of what, Abby? Stop trying to trick me. It's too late. I found out everything. Stop lying to me, damn it. At that moment, something seemed to break. She stopped whimpering and started ranting about respect for the dead, claiming that she had only ever loved me and that if I hadn't been so hesitant to try new things in the bedroom, she would never have been tempted to rekindle things with him after we got married. When I called her out on that, she lost her temper and said she was going to her sister's place until I calmed down. That's when I went into the bedroom, only to come out and see her struggling to put on her favorite leather jacket. I handed her the bag I had packed while she thought I was still in the bathroom. Here, this should keep you for now, I said sharply. You can come back for the rest in a few days. What? What are you talking about? I'm saying it's over, Abby. You're out of my life. Now get out of my sight before I do something we'll both regret. You can't do this, Robbie, 
she cried. You can't just dump me like this. Too late. I already have, I told her as I guided her to the door and opened it. I'll be seeing a lawyer in the morning about filing for divorce. And I'd suggest you do the same. For several days, she had begged and pleaded for me to take her back. When it became clear that wasn't going to happen, she began threatening to deplete my resources. I remained calm and directed her to my lawyer. He had already informed me that, since the apartment was mine before our relationship began, she had no claim to it. Additionally, given that there were no children and she was employed, it was unlikely I'd be required to pay her much, if anything. Meanwhile, as word of what had transpired spread at the factory, I started hearing about her behavior when she worked there. According to a supervisor and the general foreman, Abby was known for freely distributing her favors. The recipient of the letter is the late Joe Carpenter, who boasts that he did not have to use protection. There were others, but Joe was the only one to brag about it. I was also told there was a stack of old rugs in the warehouse still referred to as Abby's bed, likely the same one where I had my first encounter with her. There was even a rumor, never proven, that after I danced with Samantha at the Christmas party, Abby was so furious that she practically dragged Joe off for a session before doing the same with me. If true, it would explain the warmth and smooth slickness I experienced. I also learned that shortly after we got married, she began showing up at the factory during lunch breaks to take Joe off somewhere. If he wasn't working that day, someone else would be chosen. Most people thought I was foolish to marry her, but like honor among thieves, they kept quiet about it. I couldn't do much about it at the moment, of course, but I made sure to keep everything for later use. Eventually, thanks to the persistence of the police, the pieces of the puzzle started to come together. They eventually asked to examine any computers we had in the house, and I had no hesitation in handing over the two matching laptops I had bought for us. In fact, I was somewhat surprised they hadn't done this sooner. The examination took about ten days. And then things really started to go sideways. On a Wednesday morning that I'll probably never forget, I received a call from D.S. Mark Haley. He phoned me at work and politely asked if I could come down to the station with Samantha at 11 o'clock. I agreed and went to ask Sammy if she would come with me. To be honest, even though we worked in the same place and our paths naturally crossed, I hadn't seen much of her since the incident. I knew that she had kicked Gerald out of the house, and his drunken attempts to return had quickly led to a restraining order. I also knew he was suspended from work, but was still receiving his salary at that time. I had noticed that Sammy had become withdrawn and often looked like she was in a waking nightmare. Even her once glorious golden hair seemed dull and lifeless. I guessed that the memory of Joe Carpenter falling might still haunt her, along with the terrifying realization that it could have been her. She seemed resigned when she agreed to come with me, and the journey was quite uncomfortable with very little conversation. Upon our arrival, we were taken to a large, surprisingly comfortable office where Mark, Kelsey, and the same D.C., who had taken the original notes, were waiting for us. The only unexpected presence was Abby. We were informed that, although we were there to assist with their inquiries, we had the right to have a lawyer present if we wished. None of us seemed inclined to take up the offer. We were then shown the recording equipment that would be used. I was the first to wake up. Two identical laptops were placed in front of me, and I was asked which one was mine. Identifying mine was straightforward. It had been used for both work and leisure, and had a few noticeable signs of wear. Most of the marks were minor scratches on the cover, but there was one distinct chip in a corner from when I accidentally dropped it while taking it out of its case. It was easy to recognize mine and explain why. The next question was whether I ever used Abby's laptop. Again, I had no hesitation in admitting that I sometimes did. I know we're often advised not to leave valuables in the car, I said, but there are times when my laptop has been left in the trunk. 
Instead of retrieving it, I've used Abby's laptop if she wasn't using it. Usually, it was just for checking headlines or catching up on sports results. You know, that sort of thing. Have you used it to send emails? Inspector Kelsey asked. No, I've always used my own laptop for that. We had a shared email address for purchases and such, which is accessible on both laptops. But I also have a personal email account on my laptop for sending messages to club members and occasionally buying surprise gifts. The two policemen exchanged glances, nodded slightly to each other, and then informed me that I could leave if I wished. I contemplated it for a moment, then replied, If you don't mind, gentlemen, I'd prefer to stay. Mrs. Lloyd Smith has been rather fragile since the, erm, um, incident. I'm not sure what you plan to ask her, but she might benefit from having a friend's support. I heard Abby's loud, derisive snort at the mention of friend, but I managed to ignore it as another silent exchange took place between Mark and Kelsey. They clearly had a strong working relationship, reading each other's thoughts and making a swift decision. They allowed me to remain, though I had to move to a chair further from the table and promised to remain silent. Once I had taken the new seat, I observed the scene as Kelsey brought out a large stack of A4 papers. Sammy appeared somewhat disinterested and detached, while Abby was visibly restless, her need for a cigarette evident. It reminded me of the expensive cleaning service I had to hire to remove the unpleasant odor of cigarettes from my apartment. I'd like you to review these, Mrs. Lloyd Smith, Inspector Kelsey said in a gentle tone, his smile warm. Please take your time and read through them all if you would. I want you to be absolutely certain and let me know if you recognize them. He handed over the bundle of papers and Samantha flipped over the top page. I heard her sharp intake of breath, followed almost immediately by a sob that seemed to shake her fragile frame. I started to stand, but was motioned back into my seat. Samantha took several deep breaths to regain her composure, and I realized she had managed to steady herself when she turned to the next page. The silence and tension in the room were agonizing as Samantha kept reading. All that was missing for a truly dramatic scene was the steady ticking of a wall clock and the sight of the second hand marking the passing moments. Instead, the only sounds were the soft hum of recording devices and the hesitant breathing of the six people present. It had felt cool when we first arrived, but now I could feel the dampness of sweat beneath my arms, and as time dragged on, I shifted as quietly and unobtrusively as possible, trying to find some comfort in the hard chair. Sammy must have been two-thirds through the stack when she finally looked up at the two policemen and, with a pleading tone, said, I've read these before. They're the ones I told Robbie about when I found them on Gerald's computer. Do I really have to read them all? It's important, Mrs. Lloyd Smith. Inspector Kelsey said. I understand it's difficult, but it would be a great help if you could continue. Please? Very well, Mrs. Davies, Kelsey said, his voice calm but firm, instantly silencing the room. Mrs. Lloyd Smith has been reviewing a series of emails found on your computer. These emails detail not only an affair between you and Mr. Smith, but also the cold blooded and brutal plan to murder his wife. No, that's not acceptable, she shouted. I've been sitting here while you made her read whatever's on those papers, and I've been ignored, just because his... She gestured towards me. Uh, mistress is wealthy? You're treating her like royalty while I'm left in the dark about what's happening? We'll address that shortly, Kelsey responded smoothly, but Abby was not satisfied. What's going on here? Abby demanded loudly. What's on those papers, and why am I even here? The final pages were what altered everything. 
Sammy first emitted a small cry of shock, then brought the page closer to her face, as if needing to verify the text up close. A gasp of distress escaped her, almost like a sob, and she slowly set the last page face down on the pile of reed pages. Without a word, she pulled out a tissue packet from her bag, pressed one to her face, and began to sob uncontrollably. As she resumed her task, I attempted to catch Mark's eye, but he remained steadfastly focused on Sammy. I shifted my attention to Abby, trying to assess her reaction to the unfolding situation. She appeared increasingly agitated, almost as if she would trade anything for a cigarette. But from her vantage point, she couldn't see what Sammy was reading. Her curiosity was palpable, visibly tormenting her. I was struck by the image of a goldfish taken out of its bowl and placed on a carpet. Abby's mouth moved without making any sound, her arms flapped uselessly at her sides, and her legs started to shake. After a moment of coughing and spluttering, she managed to exclaim, It isn't true! It's a mistake! That's ridiculous! As I approached to comfort the sobbing Samantha, Abby glared at me and demanded, Tell them, Robbie! I wouldn't do something like that. You know I wouldn't. I don't even like that creepy bastard. Tell them. When I ignored her and wrapped my arm around Sammy's shoulder, Abby nearly screamed, I'm not staying here to be accused of something like this. I want to go home. I'm going. She headed towards the door, only to find the detective constable blocking her way. Turning back to Mark and Kelsey, the inspector declared, Very well. There may be additional charges later, but for now, Abigail Ruth Davies, I am arresting you for the attempted murder of Samantha Lloyd Smith. You do not have to say anything. That's when my wife fainted. If I had been quicker, I might have caught her before she fell. However, I figured it was a much softer fall compared to the one she had intended for Sammy so I made a half-hearted attempt that was never likely to succeed. Though God's mills grind slowly, they grind exceedingly fine. I was reminded of Longfellow's words repeatedly in the following months, especially in the company of the detectives investigating Joseph Carpenter's death. There seemed to be no rush to bring the case to court, but it was undeniably complex and would likely require considerable expert testimony to be classified as murder. During this period, I managed to convince Samantha to take a vacation. When she returned, she seemed somewhat rejuvenated, but her enthusiasm for running the business had noticeably diminished. She left most of the daily operations to me, Freddie Watson, the head salesman, and Millicent Ferguson, her former personal assistant, who had worked with her father for many years. Both Freddie and Millicent had been promoted to the board. When Gerald Smith eventually confessed his involvement, it seemed like Abby's confession was imminent, but she remained adamant in her denial. I initially thought it would be straightforward. Once Gerald admitted everything, convicting Abby would be easy. However, I soon realized that Mark was the one delaying things, as he wasn't fully convinced of her involvement. He admitted as much during a casual conversation at the club one Saturday evening. He didn't go into detail but made his doubts clear. I wanted to tell him that Abby was a skilled liar and that I had experienced her deceit firsthand. Her ability to hide her extracurricular activities was astonishing, and even in hindsight, I hadn't noticed any obvious clues. Nevertheless, I wisely chose to remain silent on the matter and understood that she was still firmly denying any knowledge of the incriminating emails or any contact with Gerald Smith. The club itself was in the process of closing down. Joe's tragic death had removed its heart, leading to a decline in membership and a decrease in the revenue generated from team-building weekends and AFF, accelerated freefall, courses. The cost of hiring the plane had become a significant burden, especially when the usual three flights per hour, with up to ten jumpers, had dwindled to just one flight per hour with an average of three jumps. Some of us, including myself, who had been there on that day, 
continued to walk along the long, wide, external step. I think most were doing it to reassure themselves that they hadn't lost their nerve. For example, Samantha made one jump and then declared it would be her last. Mark did the same, and I had completed three since then. There was another club, nearly 50 miles away, in the process of purchasing the parachuting equipment, and negotiations for the lease of the clubhouse and other facilities were underway with a small flying club. It was sad to see, but the publicity we had received made it seem inevitable. A few days later, the trial began. I couldn't attend the opening because I was scheduled to testify. I had initially thought spousal privilege would exempt me, but it turned out I was mistaken and I wasn't inclined to make a fuss about it. The trial was intimidating in every way, from the grand old fixtures in the courtroom to the bewigged barristers and their slow-moving entourage. The prosecuting counsel meticulously walked me through the events of the fatal day, which was the easier part. Then he turned to the topic of the relationship between my wife and me, which was much more challenging. For the first time, I was shown some of the documents that Samantha was asked to read, and it was easy to understand why she was upset. The first messages were nothing more than a playful online chat, typical of what many people might do for fun. Initially, these were anonymous conversations. These conversations quickly became more and more explicit. I was asked if I was aware of my wife's desire to try these types of activities, as she mentioned how difficult it was for her to convince me. I had to admit that her wishes coincided in many ways with what she was trying to convince me to do. At some point, they revealed their true nature to each other. Gerald said that given his feelings for me, he would be even more inclined to do it with her. However, Samantha hesitated, saying that such a relationship, if revealed, would end her marriage and, more importantly, the lifestyle I provided for her. She insisted that they just chat for a while. Meanwhile, the nature of their conversations became more and more open. The whole situation was deeply troubling, but it escalated when they began to discuss how to eliminate their respective partners to freely pursue their desires. Initially, their plans were tentative at best. Neither of them wanted to lose their financial support, but things took a much more serious turn when Abby proposed that an accident could resolve their issue. Although neither explicitly defined what kind of accident they meant, it was clear they were discussing a fatal one. Toward the end of their communication, Abby expressed concern about being left high and dry if their plan succeeded and Gerald suddenly came into wealth. She insisted on an insurance policy a mutual agreement that would bind them together if the plan worked. This assurance seemed to have been given and accepted, though no evidence of it was ever found. The day before the accident, Gerald sent a message indicating that the following day would be ideal and instructed Abby to keep well clear and be visibly somewhere else. The last time she had been in touch was on the actual day when she reminded him that they needed to stay apart for at least six months until things settled down. Fortunately, there was a comfort break in the proceedings after that, and then I was cross-examined by the defense. However, their efforts were in vain. I stuck firmly to what I knew for sure and didn't waver at all. My regret over the fact that the woman I had loved turned out to be so malevolent was evident, as was my clear sense of betrayal. Nonetheless, I managed to emerge from the ordeal unscathed. In the days that followed, I attended court to observe most of the prosecution's case. The evidence included how the emails had been discovered, carefully hidden on Abby's computer, the spelling errors and lack of capital letters that matched her writing habits, the times the messages had been sent, which coincided with times she was at home usually in the middle of the night when I was assumed to be asleep, and the attached photos of herself in exceptionally lewd poses, along with similar photos sent by Gerald. It was all quite damning, but the worst for her was Gerald Smith's confession admitting to everything. 
The defense attorneys seemed frustrated that she hadn't simply confessed, perhaps pleading mental incapacity and seeking mitigation. But she refused to do so and left them struggling to refute a mountain of clear evidence. She even insisted on taking the stand herself and denied any knowledge of the emails, any attempt to kill Samantha, or any contact with Gerald Smith. Despite the prosecution's strong case, she remained defiant, insisting someone else must be responsible and even attempting to resurrect Gerald's original claim about Sammy blackmailing me, despite his later admission that it was a fabrication. I missed the summing up because I had to attend a crucial board meeting that would impact the future of the business. Apparently, the prosecution took a couple of hours and the defense somewhat less. Consequently, I was not present when the jury returned later the same day with a unanimous guilty verdict. Under English law, a life sentence is mandatory for murder, and if committed with the expectation of gain from the death, it automatically entails a minimum of 30 years. I believe Abby fainted upon hearing the verdict and later became hysterical when the sentence was announced, but I wasn't there to witness either event. I had already made it clear that she was history to me, and now there was no doubt about that whatsoever. It was a breathtakingly beautiful day. I was sitting on the terrace of a villa near Grasse on the Côte d'Azur, perched on a hilltop not far from the village of Sparisades. From there, I enjoyed sweeping views of Lac de saint Cassien, the Bay of Mandelieu, and the Estorel Hills. After a light lunch, I was unwinding with a cold beer, savoring the company of someone I hadn't seen in nearly eight years. Mark Haley, now a detective chief inspector with Cheshire Police, had put on a bit of weight since we last met, but he still looked healthy and the gray streaks in his hair didn't take away from his good looks. He'd been in Marseille investigating a prohibited substances smuggling connection and, knowing I lived nearby, decided to reach out. He had initially called to suggest meeting for a drink at a bar, but I had invited him for lunch with my family, which gave us a chance to catch up on life back home. With my wife taking care of the children, we were left with some quiet time to talk. They're wonderful kids, he remarked, referring to my four-year-old son, James Griffin Davies, and his two-year-old sister, Claire. He was right. They were adorable, and I adored them completely. Don't you ever miss home, though? This is home now, Mark, I replied earnestly. We do visit relatives occasionally, but I don't think we could ever live there again. Too many bad memories? Not enough sunshine, I said, and we both chuckled and took a sip of our drinks. I had a sense that there was more to his visit than he was letting on, but it was up to him to reveal it when he was ready. So, how did you two get together? He asked, nodding toward the house. I shared the straightforward truth. Honestly, Mark, I never really expected it. It took almost a year before we both realized there were real feelings between us. We had been without partners and tended to pair up for functions and events, but we had both been hurt before and were wary of trying again. It was something that developed slowly until we were ready to admit, well, you know, that we had genuine feelings for each other. That was entirely true. Over the first year following the trial, our relationship had developed slowly and steadily. Given the condition she was in, I think I became a steadfast support for Samantha. However, I didn't want to jeopardize what we had by attempting to push it into an unwelcome romantic direction. The opportunity for change came after a dinner with a group of Japanese businessmen and their wives. I was the one driving that night. And even though she rarely drank, as I was dropping her off at her house and saying goodnight, she suddenly said, Robbie, you know, sometimes I think we spend more time together than most married couples do. It was a spontaneous comment, but it led to a brief silence. Then, as if she felt awkward about it, she started to get out of the car. I gently held her arm, and when she turned back, I responded, I'm sure we do and I cherish every moment with you.
I just wish we could have even more time together. She looked at me intently before asking if I was truly sure about that. When I assured her that I was, we shared our first genuine kiss. It wasn't passionate or transformative, but it was tender and filled with real affection. From that point on, we began dating properly. It seemed like an unspoken rule that we wouldn't rush into a physical relationship, and I was content with that. In fact, it wasn't until I reminded her of her comment about spending so much time together and suggested that we make our relationship more official that she agreed to marry me. Our courtship lasted six months, following many years of friendship, and the wedding was a simple, quiet event with only close family and friends in attendance. Our first night together took place at a honeymoon hotel in Barbados. It was a little awkward at first, since neither of us had been active for quite a long time, and I think we were both afraid of our own shortcomings. She had no reason to be nervous. To be honest, she was amazing. However, she turned out to be surprisingly shy and, given her background, rather inexperienced. From what I understood, she used to be more of a trophy wife. She was expected to give birth to one or two heirs, while her partner indulged in his vices with those whom he called girls of easy virtue. It was only when she resisted his infidelities that he tried to impose his ideas on her. We both knew about two people who were willing to experience all kinds of sensations in search of new thrills. Gerald and Abigail's emails contained open and disturbing descriptions of actions that were not only very painful but also disgusting and even illegal. We needed to sort out and discuss these disturbing memories, which we did in the first weeks of our marriage. Over time, we figured out what was acceptable and enjoyable and identified what we never wanted to go back to. I told Mark that we had an old-fashioned relationship. We decided to get married and that our love has become stronger than ever and continues to deepen every day. Yeah, I understand that. He smiled and then asked, Have you heard anything about your former partners? I shook my head. I wasn't interested in knowing that. They were in the past. Gerald seems to have adapted quite well to prison life. To be honest, I think he's kind of used to being in prison. I saw him a few weeks ago. He's still mad at Abby, insisting it was her idea even though he agreed with her. He claimed that she had promised to become the kind of partner he had always dreamed of, and he could not forgive her for refusing to take responsibility for what had happened. There's a chance that in a few years he'll be eligible for parole but I'm not sure he'll even want it by then. I tried to interrupt him before he could continue, but he pressed on. Abby's a different case altogether. She had a complete mental breakdown. She still denies any involvement in the plot against Samantha and any knowledge of those incriminating emails. The psychologists suggest it might be related to denial, possibly some form of bipolar disorder or similar. There's even a theory that there were two separate personalities, and the current one has erased any memory of the other's actions. Naturally, this means she probably won't be released for a very long time. She knows she'd have a better chance if she confessed, but she won't. And that brings us to the big question, doesn't it, Robbie? He took another swig of his beer. Hmm, what question is that? I asked trying to sound casual. He set his glass down slowly, and we locked eyes as he said, How did you do it, Robbie? I beg your pardon, I replied, feigning surprise, but he just gave me a crooked smile. Robbie, I'm a cop, he said. I may not be Sherlock Holmes, but I like to think I'm pretty good at my job. I take my time and do my best to get things right. I'm meticulous and hate the idea of wrongly accusing someone. Now, Mr. Kelsey, you remember him, don't you? I nodded, and he continued. Well, he had a very different approach than I do. He was all about results, making the numbers look good, and for a high-profile case like Joe Carpenter's death, getting a quick result and impressing the media. 
That's probably why he became chief constable while I'll never advance further before I retire. Yes, but... Just give me a few minutes, Robbie. It won't take long since my car will be picking me up soon. I just need to get this off my chest because it's been bothering me for years, okay? I nodded again and was about to speak, but he raised his hand and said, Please? So I stayed silent. See, when we were investigating, at first, I felt some sympathy for you. Don't take that the wrong way. What I mean is, you seemed to be the only one who didn't really grasp what Abby was like. You appeared to be the unfortunate husband blinded by love, unaware that your wife was cheating on you with Joe, and a few others from the factory she used to work at, namely Donald and Malcolm. But I've slowly come to realize that I was mistaken, wasn't I? You knew about it, didn't you? I did my best to look confused and a bit irritated. He was right, of course. It was the main reason I'd gotten Abby a job away from the factory, hoping it might stop. But I was well aware it hadn't. You're good, Robbie. Very good. I have to give you credit. In retrospect, I can see how you carefully and gradually drew Samantha to you. How you never condemned her husband, but instead positioned yourself as a better man. And how you made her practically dependent on you in running the business. Well, many men in your position would have done something similar, wouldn't they? They might have wanted to, I don't know, have an affair with her? Or even set her up as a replacement once you were ready to leave Abby. That might have seemed unpleasant to some, but it would have been understandable. But that wasn't enough for you, was it? You're an estate boy, just like me, and you harbored a lot of resentment. You escaped your roots, became successful and affluent, but you lost any respect due to Abby and her lover's behavior. And most of your resentment was directed at Gerald Smith, wasn't it? He paused, waiting for me to respond, but I maintained a poker face and told him to continue. It was his story. Oh, don't worry about it, Robbie. I know that if I tried to prove any of this, I'd probably end up in an institution just like your ex. I'm just doing this for my own satisfaction. The issue I've had was never really doubting that Gerald set up the parachute to kill the lovely Samantha. The idea of getting his hands on all that money must have been tempting enough for him to consider the risk worthwhile. So, I have no qualms about having sent him to prison. None at all. What really troubled me, Robbie, was how he was convinced to do it. There was something that didn't sit right with me, but I couldn't pinpoint it. That's why I tried to delay the investigation, but Kelsey was having none of that. He saw his next promotion hinging on the successful conclusion of the case, and, once he realized I was obstructing it, he pushed me aside quite harshly. It was only later, much later, that I discovered Abby was still denying any knowledge of the emails. That made me wonder if she had actually sent them. It made me think that if Abby had really wanted to, she might have had that kind of affair with Gerald. See, what I realized is that despite their filth and the passion in the messages, they had to be crafted by someone with a very cold and calculating mind. Which isn't how I'd describe Abby, would you? You were never married to her, I replied, maintaining a neutral expression. And he smiled. True enough. But let me offer an alternative scenario to the one everyone believes. Imagine, for example, that you meticulously planned a scheme to ruin both Gerald and Abby, get the woman you truly wanted, and, fortuitously or not, get rid of the man who betrayed you. Let's say you, hypothetically, created an email account on your wife's computer, one she wouldn't discover because she wasn't particularly tech-savvy, and used her persona to contact Gerald. Suppose you slipped her a sleeping pill whenever you wanted to do this. Imagine that you exaggerated her peculiar intimacy desires to appeal to someone like Gerald. 
Let's just assume you were able to mimic her style and even her mistakes to make it look like she came up with the plan and found another way to pass it on to him. Now, I'll admit I haven't figured out how you manage that, but let's just assume you did. And just imagine how satisfied you must have been when he fell for it so completely. Of course, another thing I can't know is how you arranged for Joe to be wearing the altered shoot, or if that was part of the plan or just an added benefit. But I bet you were thrilled to see him getting into the plane with Samantha's harness on. You were calm enough, or consumed by enough hatred, to watch him fall from the sky. That's something I don't think I'll ever understand, Robbie. And then you kept your cool during questioning. Just enough to be convincing, of course, knowing that the attention would soon shift from you to Gerald. After the trial, I reviewed my notes and noticed that on the day, you were the only one who didn't ask us about Joe's condition. At the time, I thought it was because you knew he had no chance of survival but now I realize it was because you were pleased to see him die. If I'm right, and though I know I'll never be able to prove it, you must be the most cruel, calculating, and cold-hearted bastard I've ever encountered. And that's saying something coming from a cop with my years of experience. Believe me. He remained silent after that, but his gaze stayed fixed on mine, so I continued. Abby is extremely ill, Mark. You've managed to turn her simple denial into an elaborate narrative. The truth is, she conspired to ruin a wonderful person, mercilessly, for her own pleasure and gain. And she can't face the fact that her schemes led to the death of someone she probably cared about more than she realized. You tell a convincing story, Mark, but I think it's more likely that an overactive imagination has been your main obstacle rather than anything else. I don't know what else to say, except that I'd appreciate it if you didn't come back here. As I finished speaking, a Renault Megane pulled up in the driveway and stopped below the terrace. We walked down to it, and just before he got into the back seat, he turned and said, You've probably gotten away with it, Robbie. I don't expect you'll ever have to answer for what you did unless some higher power has plans for you. I won't dwell on it. I have my own life to live. And frankly, I wouldn't want to confront you anyway, because I truly believe you're the most ruthless and dangerous person I've ever met. You don't seem to have a guilty conscience, but I still hope you'll reflect on what you've done to Abby. Maybe remember how you once felt about her? She suffered enough, don't you think? I watched the car drive away, and turning around, saw Samantha waving goodbye from one of the windows. I went back to my beer, finished it off, and reflected on what he had said. He was correct about many things, but he was very mistaken if he thought she had suffered enough. The only fortunate aspect of Joe's death was that Samantha chose to speak to me, rather than me having to come up with a ready excuse to keep her from boarding the plane for the jump. I was fully aware that Joe and Donald would come to borrow our parachutes. They were known for saving money this way, instead of renting them. And I didn't care in the slightest which of them used Sammy's chute. I also knew that Donald and Malcolm were struggling these days. After we sold the business to the Japanese company, the new management didn't sit well with them, or with several others. They were labeled as troublemakers, and, despite their long service, were shown the door with minimal formality. As for me, dangerous? I'm just an accountant, right? Samantha and I used some of the money to buy the villa we now live in, and there was plenty left to live comfortably off the interest alone. But old habits die hard, so I still work from home managing the financial affairs of some of our affluent neighbors. As I stood up, Sammy appeared at the door and hurried toward me. She still looked slender enough that it was hard to tell she was carrying our third child. Mark's gone? she asked. Yes, back to dear old England, I grinned. Ugh, he's welcome to it, she replied with a feigned shiver, then continued. Anyway, 
The kids are napping, and I was wondering, um. I raised an eyebrow and waited until, after a moment, she burst into giggles and said, There's no point in making me ask. You cheeky devil. I'm going to lie down for an hour or so. Then she reached out her hand, kissed me on the lips, and headed back to the door, which certainly interested me. By the time I got inside and closed the door behind me, I had already forgotten about Mark Haley and everything else that had happened in the past.